Okay. Go for it, Tian. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Talk Math with Your Friends. Our speaker today is Dr. Joe Moeller. Dr. Moeller is a postdoc with NIST, and today he will be talking to us about using combinatorics to motivate category theory. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Dr. Moeller. Thank you. Um, right, so, uh, yeah, so today I'll, I'll be telling you about, I'm gonna be telling you about category theory and introducing the, uh, I think the most basic elements of, of, of the theory of categories. And uh, I'm gonna try to motivate it with um, combinatorics. Also, uh, I get a lot of uh, fire trucks going really close to my house. So um, if you hear sirens, can't do much about it. Um, They're not coming to your house though, right? We're okay? Uh, yeah, we're, we'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, right, and so I, uh, I just wanted to start with the land acknowledgement because uh, my hometown is on Kuwait land and UC Riverside is on Tongva land and then where I live now is on this Scottaway land, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. Uh, and that's where I'm doing, that's where I've done all of this work. So, um, so on Twitter, uh, I asked people uh, what they found daunting about category theory. So I want to ask the audience the same thing. And so, um, you know, what did you find daunting about category theory? Because lots of people do find it daunting at first, or, you know, they, it doesn't stop seeming daunting. Uh, and in particular, what do you find most off-putting? So I, I want uh, input from, from the audience as well, uh, but I'll share first with you the responses that I got on Twitter. This was a few, a few months ago. So uh, some of the people, uh, so I like this response because uh, I, I definitely agree. Um, there's definitely a lot of uh, really cool people in category theory who are, you know, explicitly uh, going out of their way to be, to be inclusive and, and change the culture in mathematics in general and uh, um, but there there's there's uh, you know some of the people are also uh, off-putting um, what else so so building on the on the previous point uh, somebody said that they were off-put by the the fervor it inspires in some people um, and they say that maybe that's unfair and so this is a really interesting one, I think, because um, because it's true. Uh, category theorists, for some reason, seem to be incredibly passionate about category theory. Uh, I don't really have a good explanation for why this is the case, uh, why it should be the case more than than other fields. But there's something really. I, I mean, I, I experience it myself. I, you know, I can't help but sometimes feel like uh, like there's some kind of, you know, intellectual revolution that's, that's occurring because of category theory or something. And category theorists, when they talk to, you know, amongst themselves, they, they sort of indulge in this, uh, sort of talk pretty freely. Um, but then when you talk to other mathematicians, it can seem unhinged sometimes, or, uh, I don't know. Um, but it, but it is off-putting to, to people, you know, if you're not a category theorist and you hear people talking this way, uh, you just think, well, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna be a part of that group. Um, then, so this is someone agreeing with someone else, but the, the main thing that they're saying here is that the examples, even the elementary examples in category theory come from homological algebra, algebraic geometry, algebraic topology, uh, you know, these fields that, that people can sometimes consider as, as very fancy or very, uh, you know, advanced or unattainable, especially to this particular person as a graph theorist. So maybe they, they feel like they, they never needed to really study those things in order to get up to the research level in their field. And so uh, those being the primary examples that are given in, in a basic category theory textbook or course, uh, makes it seem inaccessible. Um, and this is a pretty common 
theme. So I think this one, this comment is going to be uh, very similar. Um, yeah, this person is saying uh, the examples. Oh, this is this is the sorry. This one is a little bit different. This one is saying that that sometimes category theory doesn't have any examples. That uh, you know they're just following the 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 path of abstraction without anything firm underneath you. Uh, and this one I think is uh, easy to, to feel this way when you're reading category theory, because there really is a lot of the category theory literature that doesn't bother mentioning uh, the motivating examples sometimes. And um, maybe to, to certain audiences, the examples are extremely clear. Um, but if you're coming from outside of the category theory community and you see these things, then, uh, you know, it's, it's going to, again, seem unattainable, you know, like, uh, often category, categories are essentially other branches of math. And if you, if you want examples of categories that do things, then the examples are going to be field, other fields of math, basically, and those should have their own examples. So that leads to the common uh, phrase that, like, in category theory, the examples need examples. Um, uh, here's another comment about examples. Um, so this person says there should be more basic examples. So an intro to discrete math with category theory uh, would be great. That's what their suggestion is. And that's, that's essentially what I'm going to try to do. So maybe discrete math, uh, not exactly, uh, but maybe more specifically combinatorics. I think the difference between those is a little Subtle, but that but combinatorics is pretty close to discrete math, um, and yeah, and it, they say graphs, trees, lists, and multisets, and some of those things will appear in my talk today. Uh, and this last comment says, um, you know, that uh, category theory and examples. The thing about those is that different people want different examples, uh, and they don't want to wade through other people's examples. So that, that means that there has to be a bunch of different introductions to category theory, you know, introductions that take different routes. Um, so uh, I wonder if, if uh, BK, you could mm -hmm. tell me if there are any, uh, any other responses to my question. Um, Nobody in the chat, but my answer to the question would have been, I think it connects several of the themes you've mentioned. Like, I really love the idea that you're gonna sort of look at something from a more abstract perspective and be able to see two things that seem different as the same, but sometimes that comes across as, what are you, a child, that you don't know how to see that those two things as the same already, um, which sort of connects um, several of those things. Emily Real gave a really great talk that I went to not too long ago that like really thought about, associativity as sort of uniqueness in a certain kind of way. And I was just like, awesome. This is the kind of thing I want out of category theory, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting point because I think a, a, an easy thing to point to is that often you'll hear a category theorist say the word just a lot. So, you know, a monad is just a monoid in category of endofunctors. And that, that word just by itself can, can you know, by itself be very off-putting uh, because it, it, it does imply, you know, what you were saying that like it, you know, that there's this connection between these two concepts and it should be really trivial to see why, why haven't you seen it yet? Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I try to replace just in, in that context with like precisely. So an X is precisely a Y in Z or something like that. Um, it just I has missed like one connotation. I missed one earlier. Sydney said the terminology, which I think connects with what you're just saying. Mm -hmm. Other people are mentioning the distributive law, the word obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think this is pretty uh, embedded in in category theory culture, maybe to say to say like obvious and just. I mean, obvious is pretty. Uh, common in, in all of mathematics, but but saying that one thing is just another thing is specific to uh, category theory, maybe. And if I do that here and it's, you know, creating some confusion or something, then please stop me and, you know, tell me not to say just or something. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see, I'll move on. Um, 
So enumerative combinatorics is uh, what I'm going to be uh, taking my examples from uh, to motivate category theory. So Richard Stanley wrote a famous book on enumerative combinatorics. And uh, I like this quote as just like a, an explanation of what I mean by enumerative combinatorics. So basic problem is counting the number of elements of a finite set. Uh, so that makes it sound really, um, I don't know, uh, but usually we're given an infinite collection of, fi of these finite sets uh, and they're indexed by you know, something. Here, I'm gonna say that they're indexed by natural numbers. So that n is a natural number. And we wish to count uh, the number, which here I'm writing with a little f, of elements in each of those sets, big F, simultaneously. So that means that we wanna come up with some kind of a formula that uh, expresses that number um, for various inputs. Uh, so I'm gonna try uh, drawing pictures now. So uh, I have some examples here of, of what I'm gonna call combinatorial gizmos. Uh, so different things that you might encounter in a combinatorics class. Um, and so here's an example of a, of a simple graph. Uh, the, the adjective simple there is, is saying that we can have one or zero edges between two nodes um, and there's no loops allowed. Uh, and the, yeah, there's not multiple edges. I already said that. And there's also no direction on these edges. So here's a simple graph. Um, a partition, um, I'm gonna put more elements here. A partition, for me, what I mean by that is, is that I have a set and uh, I'm breaking it up into chunks like this. So I group these ones together and I group these ones together. And I'm saying, um, and, and these, these chunks are not allowed to be empty at all. Um, what about permutations? So a permutation of, let's say a three element set, um, I'll, I'll label these, oh, that's unreadable. Uh, a, B, C, and these are the same, A, B, C. And so uh, a permutation is gonna be an assignment from, from this set to itself. And so here's one such thing um, that, uh, you know, these, these, er these uh, lines that I'm using to connect are never gonna map two things to the same thing. And um, also everything gets assigned to by something, right? Uh, and the total order, so, so let me continue with A, B, C and say, here's a total order A, B, C. Um, I'm gonna draw them like this. So uh, B is the smallest element, then A above that and C above that. So I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not using the order of the alphabet, for instance, uh, I'm just putting them in some order. Right, so these are, these are some of the examples I'm gonna be using. Um, and uh, the important thing about all of these that uh, is gonna be our, our, the idea that's gonna be our jumping off point here is that any of these structures, um, I labeled the bottom two and I didn't label the, the elements of the top two. And uh, really any of these things, you could talk about these structures without referring to a specific label, or I should say, uh, you could change the labels on these nodes um, in all of these examples without changing the fundamental structure. You know, these aren't structures that depend on what these elements are, or what I'm labeling the dots with. Um, and so that's gonna manifest as saying that we have a, um, an action of the symmetric group uh, on the on these sets of things. Oops. Okay. So, and just to make sure I'm following, like the the partitions, you have to have. I mean, you don't have to have a labeling, but you have to think of them as distinct in a particular kind of way, because to get. So it's not just, yeah, but you could change what those labels are and you'd get an equivalent set of all the partitions. But if they're unlabeled, then, then it's something different, right? Right, so that, that, okay. that's why I started to take back what I was, what I started okay. to do, which was, I said, you can do it without referencing labels. Now you, you should reference labels when you're 
you're doing it, but you can change the labels and you're not fundamentally changing anything important about the partition that you did. Uh, it is a different partition on, on a different set, but it's fundamentally like the same thing. Um, yeah, so I have to clear the drawings every time I draw them because I didn't think ahead. Um, okay, so here's a slogan. I'm gonna have a, a bunch of slogans throughout the talk. Um, they're, they're gonna be like little nuggets that you can sort of take away and try to maybe try to understand it, or if you just do understand it, then this can be like the way that you think about a particular concept. So a group is gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say that a group is a collection of abstract symmetries and an action of a group on a set is a realization of that group as the real symmetries of some object. And so in particular, I wanna say that, um, that this is what a, a group looks like. So a group is not, uh, so, sorry. So a group is an ab a collection of abstract symmetries, meaning that there isn't anything real here. It is just the symmetries themselves. But then when you have an action of, of a group on something, um, so here I have this set, which I haven't told you what it is yet. Um, but if you have this group over here, and these are the elements of the group, uh, then saying that you have an action of this group on this set is realizing these abstract symmetries as real symmetries on this, on this set. Um, and I wanna take that idea and make it a real thing, not just like a weird picture that I drew, um, justify this, this claim that that's what they are. And uh, in particular, this is gonna be important for us because I said before that uh, actions of the symmetric group are gonna be a key component of how we're gonna talk about families of combinatorial gizmos. And um, in particular, if I had a permutation on three elements, for instance, um, here's, the, uh, here's the, the set of simple graphs with, with a three element set, with a fixed three element set as its set of nodes. Um, and uh, if you have a permutation on three, then you can, you can get a, uh, a, sorry, an, a, a bijection uh, from that set to itself, from the set of simple graphs to itself with three nodes. Um, and that's gonna be a key piece of what we're, we're doing moving forward. So uh, I need to tell you the definition of category. Um, and that's, that's gonna be how we make that uh, previous picture real and uh, justified. Um, so a category, it, it has a collection of objects and it has for every pair of objects, a collection of morphisms. And we draw the morphisms as arrows from the first object to the second object. And uh, this is how I denote the set of objects. So C is the name of the category. And then the set of morphisms or arrows from X to Y, you, didn't, you write C of X, Y. Or you just draw an arrow from X to Y and call it F or something. Uh, and it has to satisfy a bunch of properties. So what does it have to satisfy? Uh, when the, the end of, of one arrow is the same as the beginning of another arrow, then you can always take those two and compose them, right? And so this is supposed to make you think of the category of sets. That's why I have uh, this example over here. Um, that's what the com word compose is supposed to make you think of, and even this notation. Uh, you can compose uh, functions, and you can compose morphisms in any category uh, to give you one that goes from the beginning of the first to the end of the last, right? Um, and that composition has to satisfy two properties. Uh, it's associative, and um, there is an identity morphism for every object that uh, is neutral with respect to that composition. Um, and so this is what I visualize whenever I'm talking about composition. You have two arrows that uh, happen to have a common point in the middle, and then this thing always exists, the composite. Uh, so the category of sets is uh, probably, it's probably uncontroversial to say it is the most important category. Um, but uh, here, here's the definition. It's gonna be really important for us moving forward. Uh, so, so an object here is a set, and a morphism here is a function between the sets. Composing is exactly composing functions, and the identity is the identity function, the identity maps on any given set. The identity map on any given set is a, the identity function. 
Uh, and so the slogan here uh, is that a category is a type of thing together with a type of relationship between those things. Um, so, so an object is a type of thing and a, and a function is a type of relationship that you can have between sets. Um, and so uh, a question for the audience that maybe we can, we can uh, talk about at the end of the talk, um, but I want you to think about it now, uh, is can you think of any other things that, are, that, are, that should be categories? So um, sets and functions, there's, if you've, there should be a lot of other things that come to mind when uh, you think about sets and functions and what, what can you change to get other types of categories. Um, but I'm, I'm just going to go with set for now because uh, there's a lot to cover. Um, but I want to compare this definition to one that I, I think you might already know, which is the definition of a group. Um, so I put that as a, as a prerequisite for the talk because uh, I really want to take this definition of group and I hope that you know that and then I, and then compare it to the definition of category. So uh, I push the, I put this dash here uh, because um, I want them to line up perfectly. So I want the, the, the items in these lists to, to line up with each other perfectly. Um, so in a group, we have a set G, we can take two elements and, and find their product. Um, and it's associative, it has identity element and it has inverse elements. So the associative and identity sound exactly like what we had over in a category. Um, the product uh, is comparable to, to composing, but there's something a little bit funny about it. Um, in categories, uh, we have this condition that you can compose them when, they're, when they have a common endpoint in the, in the middle. Um, but in groups, we don't seem to have any condition on when you can take two things and multiply them. Uh, so that's a little funny. And then also groups have this extra thing. Um, so they're missing one thing up here and they have this extra thing at the bottom uh, that all, all the elements have, uh, have a, a friend who is their inverse and that there isn't anything in the definition of category that uh, is directly comparable to that. Um, so uh, this, this comparison right here is, is uh, well, we can we can make it a real, a re it's not just a thing that feels like there's something uh, between those two, it's, it's a real thing you can do, is take a group and then make up a category that, that uh, out, of, out of the pieces of the group. So uh, what are the objects here? This one's a little bit funny. Uh, there's only one object and it, it isn't anything at all. So uh, I'm just gonna call it a, a big dot. Um, there's nothing, there's nothing to it though. So, so if you're, you know, you have a group in mind, this isn't anything that's in that group, uh, but the morphisms are going to be the elements of that group, right? So, uh, you have this set G and, uh, all the elements of that are going to be, uh, the arrows here, but now, uh, you know, consider the fact that the endpoints here are, are always going to be, uh, lined up perfectly that you could always, you could always compose those. Um, uh, so we have to give a com composition rule though, and that's going to be multiplying in the group because these arrows are elements of the group. And when they line up, which is always, you multiply them and that's the composite. And the identity map is the identity uh, element, right? And uh, this is a really good thing to do with a group uh, if you like categories, because actually groups are equivalent to, to categories that have one object and also happen to have uh, their morphisms having an inverse. Um, so it's, so it's equivalent. It's the, it's the same piece of data. Um, and, and that means that we, why isn't it going forward? that means that this picture is, is like strictly accurate. If you want, if you visualize categories as dots and arrows, uh, then a group is really a dot that's just like a single dot. And then all of the elements of the group are, 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 loop arrows that happen to have inverses. That's an important condition. Um, and so this is what we're gonna start with uh, to, to um, gonna be a key ingredient moving forward. Uh, so here's another slogan. Uh, whenever you study a mathematical gizmo, uh, ask yourself what sorts of relationships these can have. Uh, Cause remember the previous slogan was that um, 
categories are, are types of things and then types of relationships between them. So whenever you're studying a thing, you should ask what are the relationships between those things. And in particular, you can apply that to categories themselves. So what is a map between categories? Uh, that's gonna be a functor. Um, and so here's the definition of functor. Uh, you have two categories, they each have a set of objects and they each have a bunch of uh, sets of morphisms between those objects. Um, and so it's a function on the object sets. And then for a pair of objects, it's a, a function like this. Um, I'm gonna unpack a lot of this definition in a minute, but um, the, the important things are that it preserves identity and it preserves composition in this way. And this might look really familiar to you thinking about groups and such. Uh, but here's, here's an example. I gave you the example of set as a category. Uh, and here's an example of a functor from set to itself. It happens to have the same uh, domain encoded. Um, so we're going to take a set. And here's a, a very common thing to do to a set is find its power set, the set of all subsets of it. Um, and that's a functor. So it's going to take an object here and send it to another object here. Um, and, but it also has to do something to the morphism. So if you have a morphism in set, which is just a function, uh, then it should give you a, a function between the power sets uh, going in the same direction. And so that's going to be given by taking the image of your subset under that function. Right, so that's one example of a, of a functor. Um, but the other example of category that I gave you was that you can take any group and turn it into a category. Um, and so something similar is going to happen here with the definition of functor. Um, so here's another comparison. We have functor over here and then an action of a group on this side. Um, so I said a functor. Uh, as a function at the object level. Uh, remember that groups didn't have anything at the object level or they had just a trivial or a, a nothing piece of data at the object level. So there's similarly nothing here. Um, and then for, for objects, X and Y, there's a function that goes from arrows between X and Y to arrows between their image over in D. Uh, and then the thing that I'm, I'm claiming is comparable to that in the in group theory world is uh, a function from, from, from this, the group G into the, the group of automorphisms on, on your set X, so a, a, a bijection from X to itself. Um, and it satisfies these two properties, but these two properties are exactly the condition of being a group homomorphism. homomorphism. Uh, but they're, they're directly comparable to the conditions of being a functor, right? So uh, a functor preserves identity maps and it preserves composition in this very group homomorphism looking way. And it is exactly that. Um, and so this, this is the other picture that I had uh, at the very beginning. So I have a group here and then a set here, which is being acted on uh, by that. And, um, and sorry, this is and so this these two things that are comparable are are it's like a direct. Um, sorry, I wanted to say something here that was uh, that a, that a, a that an action a group action on a set is really exactly a functor um, from that one object category into the category of sets. Um, so I'm going to pause for a sec and ask if there's anything. Uh, about what I've said so far, uh, if there's any, if there are any questions. So the first thing I remember hearing about category theory was it's like set theory, but you pretend that you can't look at the individual elements of the sets. Mm -hmm. So you have like you have sets as objects of themselves, but they're not composed of smaller things. And I think that maps that metaphor maps to what you're saying that sort of, but then your examples all are made of things that are sets. Is that, is that an accurate summary? Yeah, so, so 
my and so my examples yeah everything is very uh built on top of sets but um yeah the idea behind what you were saying that like um you don't have access to the element level data when you're talking about a general category is that um you know you, it, it's sort of like you're playing a game where okay i i you know in in um you know at some point i took a class where i learned about sets and then i took another class where i learned about groups and and functions between the sets and homomorphisms between the groups and everything there i have access to the elements um but when you start talking about categories it's like you're playing a game where you're saying what if i had to do set theory or what if i had to do group theory but the only words i could use were I have a group and I have a homomorphism of groups. Those are the two things you're allowed to say. You're not allowed to say, I have an element of the group. You don't have access like to that vocabulary. Then you then the question is like, how much group theory could you really do with with only access to that much? Um, yeah. Great. And so like the identity function on X its property is defined in terms of how it behaves with the other uh, morphisms, not anything about the individual objects. And mm -hmm. so you can't computationally check it as a, it's not a function, right? You can't computationally check it in that way that we could with other kinds of things. It has to be about how it plays with the other arrows. Yeah, exactly. So, so in general, there is, there's, there's no set. Your objects aren't sets in general. And so you don't have access to saying, this is a function that when I plug in these elements, they do this. Um, sometimes your morphisms just are uh, like re like relationships. So um, for instance, if you have a partially ordered set, you can make up a category where the elements uh, of, the, of the set are your objects. But now a morphism is just the relationship of one element being less than the other in your post set. Right, that's not a function. It's just a relationship, and it's either true or it's false, and that's that corresponds to the morphism either existing or not, and then that's it. So there's no function to like plug things into or check. The elements of your post set are, I guess, probably not sets. Uh, so, um, but everything about category theory still applies to that scenario, um, and I guess I guess the same is true with. Uh, with groups thought of as one object categories, the one object isn't anything. Like I said before, it's it's just like I drew a dot because I needed to draw something. Um, I didn't want to waste a letter on it, so I just gave it a, a dot. Uh, there's no set there. It's just there. The set is the the set of morphisms on that dot um, the loops. Uh, but there's no set sitting in there. Um, I have one right here. Uh, you know, maybe there maybe there is in some particular examples. Maybe you can say like uh, the symmetric group on four letters is uh, like the automorphisms of a four element set. And so in that case, you could say there is, but uh, it's not it's not true in general. And in fact, there are there are categories that people have proven you can't you can't represent it as as a bunch of sets. You couldn't even make up something that looks like a bunch of sets and functions. So is there an analog to representation theory where it's like all the possible SETI objects that you could put in place of the generic objects and that somehow captures the structure of the, of the category? Just like for every group, you can think about how it could act on say a vector space and you get sort of some, some subset of the structure of the group. Anyways, you can, you can go on, that's it, you can talk. Okay. Yeah, there's there's lots of connections to representation theory, and I'm super interested in in that stuff right now. So so your question is super intriguing to me. Um, but yeah, I, I'll move on. Okay. So now I'm going to define a uh, species for you, which is sort of like the the main character of of the talk. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to define the symmetric groupoid. So so the name here is supposed to make you think about the symmetric group, uh, but I'm just tweaking it a little bit. So uh, the symmetric groupoid, I'm going to call it S because I call the symmetric groups SN. And this is just removing that N. Um, the symmetric groupoid is S, and it's 
the disjoint union of all the symmetric groups thought of as these one object categories. So here's all the symmetric groups. Um, the symmetric group on zeros is the is the the one element group, and so is the symmetric group on one. Uh, the symmetric group on two has two elements, so that's why it, there's two loops here. Symmetric group on three has six elements, and uh, four I think it goes up to 24, so I didn't want to draw that. And it goes on uh, for all the natural numbers, um, you know, so five and six and stuff. That th those are all going to be here as well. Um, and and it's this whole category that that uh, we're talking about. These are all this is these are all the objects, and all the, all the elements of all the groups are are all the morphisms here. Um, and so here's our definition: a species is a functor from this category that I just told you about into set. And so here's my picture of what that looks like. We have the symmetric group void right here, and it's really just all the symmetric groups sitting next to each other um, and a functor into set. So I told you before that an action is a functor into set from a group. Uh, but now um, we have a bunch of different objects. And so each of them picks out a set to, to act on. And then the condition of being a functor that it sends arrows over to other arrows in the target category is going to tell you what the action of each of these individually is, is, is doing to the, to the set it picked out, right? So, um, so, so the, 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 de the definition of a combinatorial species that's more broken down into uh, ordinary group theory language is that we have a family of sets, one for each natural number, and each one of those is acted on by the corresponding symmetric group. Um, so this is, might be a thing that, you know, you could have thought of just thinking about combinatorics in like a group theory class. Um, but we're putting it into categorical language so that we can use the tools of category theory to say more things about it. Um, right, so uh, let me give you some examples of, of this. So a three coloring is going to be um, the three coloring is going to be where we have a set and we give it the structure of a three coloring by drawing one of three colors on each element. Uh, so here's an example. We have uh, A, we're going to consider A through E as our set. And I want A and D to be red. And Blue is going to be B only. And then green is going to be C and E. Um, so this is a three coloring on the set A, B, C, D, E. Um, a simpler way to, or maybe a more formal way to think about, about what this is, is that a, a three coloring on a set X is going to be the set of functions that go from X into red, blue, and green. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is like a, a formal way of talking about, but this is what it really is. And so if we're talking about a five element set, then saying that this is a species means that I should have an action of the symmetric group uh, on five on it. Um, so let's say I'm going to write this down as one of these. So uh, A, B, C, D, E. Here's, here's my set. And then here's my uh, set of colors. So red, oops, blue, green. And we have this assignment of each of these elements to the colors. Uh, so A was red, so it was D, B is blue, and then C and E are green. Uh, so now if I have an element of the symmetric group on five letters, um, then I can, I can draw that like this. Uh, so uh, here's 
uh, let me write down what permutation this is. So this is one, two, three, five, four. Two, three, five, four. Um, so what does this look like? Two goes to three. Um, this one goes to five. This one goes to one. All right, so here's a permutation on this set A, B, C, D, E. Um, and then we can, uh, you know, just compose these, just like follow through these lines to, to get a new coloring on, on the set A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so what does that look like? What is the result? The result is, um, let's see, D and E are both going to be red, right? Follow them through. And then blue, uh, now A is blue. And then what is green, B and C. Right, and so here's a new, here's a new coloring on, on the five element set uh, that's given, that is that map, that this one is mapped to under the permutation one, two, three, five, four. Um, right, so this is, this is a species. I, you, can, you can imagine doing the same thing to any other size set and with any other kind of permutations, you can do the same thing. Um, you can also change the number of colors if you want. Um, yeah. So, so you chose to have SN act on the set of size N, but that's not required in your species definition, right? So, so let's see, uh, S5 is acting on T, C, five. Um, yeah, that's, that part is required in the definition of species. Um, the five and the five matching is required. Oh, okay. um, yeah. Okay. Um, I have to clear it every time before I move on, which is gonna suck, but uh, the next one is partitions. Um, so I was telling you about partitions before, um, and here's an example of a partition. You can have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, so partition is where you take this and you break it up into chunks or parts uh, that are non-empty. Um, and you can act on this by the symmetric group by saying that if, um, so, so let me give a definition first. So, so a partition on, on X is a set of, a set of subsets of your set X so that um, the union of all of your sets is X. The intersection of any two that are different, um, any two parts is always empty, so they have no overlaps. And also, um, none of them are empty themselves. So UI is never empty. Uh, and so if you have one, one of these things, you, I, and you have a permutation. Um, so Sn, where n is the size of the set x, uh, then you can turn this into a new partition uh, by, by taking the image of each set individually under this permutation. Um, so if you had a, par a permutation, a uh, permutation on, on a set with eight elements, then you could just rearrange these and that would give you a new partition. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, oops. Uh, yeah, so permutations. Um, all right, so if I have a permutation on three things, uh, here's one for example. 
then um, this could be this would be an element of um, this would be an element of perm of three. So uh, perm is what I'm using for the name of the species of permutations. Um, but if I have another permutation, so if I have another, if I have an element of the symmetric group, um, so on S3, uh, then we give this a name F. I'm going to use F for this to distinguish it from like Greek letters for the elements of the group. Um, then I can do, I can act on on the set of permutations on three uh, by saying um, uh, by sorry uh, by saying sorry I'm slightly confused by what I wrote down. Um, Oh yeah, sorry. I, I wrote these backwards from what I, I wanted to write, but uh, I'll just adjust. And you can act, you can act on it by saying um, sigma f uh, sigma inverse is going to be another element of permutations on three. All right. So if I add another one, um, let's say here's f. Um, here's the same F that I had above. Uh, no, I immediately started drawing it wrong. Okay, here's my permutation. Um, and then I had a, a bijection on three things, then that's going to look very similar. Um, I'm going to stick it and its inverse on either end of it. So here, here's F. Here's going to be sigma. Um, I'll pick something easy. And then here's a uh, sigma inverse. It's going to actually be the same thing like this. And the result is going to be uh, slightly different. So now this one is going to go all the way to the bottom. And this one goes up to one. This one goes up here. Uh, so that's that's how um, symmetric group is it going to act on the set of permutations. And uh, total orders. I'm going to like pass this to to try to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so being finite is going to be a weird one. There's a there's going to be a species. Which I'm calling E, which is going to be, I'm just giving the type of any species, any species that looks like this. Uh, but what it's going to do is it's going to send some natural number always to a one element set, right? So it doesn't matter what the element is, but it's a, a singleton. And uh, if you have any permutation, um, sorry. Any permutation, um, it's always going to get mapped to uh, the identity on that one element set. Sorry, I was writing it for identity. Um, so you can, so there isn't any actual combinatorial gizmo here, um, but this is perfectly fine to define. Uh, and I, I call it being finite because um, if you have an n element set and you're making up some kind of structure where there's only one possible way of having that structure, then you might as well say that that structure is just the structure of being a finite set. So it's a little bit silly, but it it, may, it makes it easier to think about sometimes. Um, and that's all there's this. Let me let me stop here for a second. See, are there any more? Any more questions? I don't think anyone has uh, asked anything out loud. I kind of expected you to say graph morphisms, which of course is kind of functors as functions on graphs. And if it, it was a directed graph, then the preserving structure is the preserving structure. 
right? Mm -hmm. So is, is that is that a reasonable way to think about functors as graph morphisms? Yes, I yeah, that I really should have uh, said that. That's a really great way to think about it. Um, yeah. So so if you think about categories as graphs, which I've been drawing pictures of categories, sort of like directed graphs this whole time, then it, whatever you think a graph homomorphism should do, uh, that's exactly what functors do. Um, there's there's the extra bit about composition, but otherwise it, it looks it looks very similar to that. So. Great. So we only have about seven minutes left. I, I bet you have other things planned. I am always curious about what the word natural means. Mm -hmm. when just, so um, I don't know. If that's one of the things you were thinking about talking about, I'd be interested in that. OK, so maybe I'll try uh, fast forwarding a lot. <laughs> um, so, so first, let me say that a generating function for a species is when um, you make up a formal power series where the coefficients in front of it, in front of all of the terms, are going to be uh, the size of, of the set of f type things on an n element set divided by n factorial. Um, and we do not care about convergence for these. Um, And so then I was going to tell you about uh, computing some of these. Uh, so the funny one was um, that, that I called E actually has the exponential function as its generating function. Uh, the three colors uh, species, its generating function is E to the 3t. Um, and uh, And OK, and here's the part that I, I was going to use to lead into talking about natural transformation. So this is where I'll fast forward to. Um, so the generating uh, function for the species of total orders is actually uh, 1 over 1 minus t. Um, and uh, that's exactly the same generating function as the one for permutations. Um, and that makes sense too if you know, if you happen to already know that total orders and permutations uh, have the same amount, right? So a total order on an n element set is, uh, there's n factorial of those. And the same is true of permutations. There's n factorial permutations on an n element set. Uh, so this sort of leads naturally to the question of uh, what of are 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 this are these two species exactly exactly the same thing, um, and we're going to use natural transformations to tell us that no, actually there's there's a subtle difference between these two, despite ha them having the same number of things. Um, so what is an isomorphism of species? So the question is, are these isomorphic? We have to know what an isomorphism is, and what is a map of functors? Uh, comes from that because these are functors and a map of them should be a map of functors. Um, so that's what a natural transformation is. So a natural transformation between two functors is a bunch of maps in the target category uh, called alpha x and that x is referring to the objects of C. Um, and you, so you have this big family of morphisms and, and they make this square commute. So this is also going to be explanation of what commuting diagrams means. It means that this equation holds. If you, so if you look at this path right here, gf alpha x, and you look at this other path, saying that this commutes means that uh, those two must be equal. Those two composites must be equal. And this, this is called the naturality condition. So if you have a big family of maps and all of these commute, then you say it's a natural transformation. The, the family of maps is a natural transformation. Um, and so this tells us what a map of species should be. We have these two functors. Um, the objects in our source category are natural numbers or finite sets, depending on what you like. Um, and so we have a, a map for each of those that goes between F structures on an N element set and G structures on an N element set. 
and it commutes with the group action. That's what this condition means. So if you act and then do alpha, or if you do alpha and then act over in G instead, then, then those have to give the same results. Um, and so we can ask, is there an isomorphism between total orders and permutations? Uh, well, if there is, then it'll have a, a two component um, and it'll satisfy this commutative square. Uh, but let's look at what the set of total orders on two is. It's these two. And a set of permutations, I'll call it id two, the identity on two. And then the other one is f, so it's the thing that switches two. Um, the condition of, um, sorry, there's only two options for what this maps alpha, sorry, I put sigma two, I meant alpha two. There's only two choices of what it can be, since these are both two element sets. It's either going to um, send one less than two to the identity, or it's going to send it to F. So let's pick um, it sending one less than two to the identity. Uh, if you do that, then you can compute this side of the square. What does it do? Uh, well, we said it sends this to the identity. And then the definition of the, the action for the permutation species is that it does this conjugation. That's the identity. Uh, but if you go the other direction uh, in this diagram, then we're doing the action for total orders, um, which I didn't tell you about. But uh, if you do it with this switching map, it'll switch the two elements in there. Uh, and then we do alpha 2, which we just said that it has to send 1 less than 2 to identity, which means it has to send 2 less than 1 to f. So that's what it sends it to, f. Uh, and these don't equal each other. Uh, therefore, this square can't exist, which means that alpha in general cannot exist. There is no, there's no natural transformation uh, of this form, uh, no natural isomorphism. Um, and I only checked it for one of these uh, alpha twos, um, but it doesn't work for the other choice either. There's only two choices. And so there, there is no isomorphism. So they're, they're, even though they're the same size, uh, sets, um, total orders and permutations always have the same amount. Uh, they're not isomorphic as species. So species are able to detect some kind of subtle difference between, between these types of gizmo gizmos that isn't just how many are there. Um, cool. Yep, and that, that's the end of my talk. <laughs> awesome, thank you. Um, I would love to stay and talk a whole bunch. Maybe we'll talk on Twitter, but I have a faculty senate I have to run to. Um, but uh, I don't know, TJ, Tian, other Kate might uh, be able to hang out. So uh, thank you so much. Next week we have two um, recent undergrads talking about their experience doing research. So they're gonna talk a little about the research they did, but they're also gonna talk about the experience of doing undergrad research. So please tell your undergrad friends who might be interested in research experiences that'll be for them. So thanks, Joe. And then uh, feel free to hang out and chat. Sorry, I gotta run. <laughs> See you later. So I gotta run in a minute. I got a meeting at five, but uh, can I ask a question? Go ahead, friend. Matt. I gotta attach. Uh, so you said there's this uh, uh, categories of group and vice versa.